Not yet? There, now it's on. Check. Check. Um, uh, we're going to sing a new song that none of you have ever heard because I wrote it this weekend. It's um, beautiful. And it's right from uh, Joshua chapter 1. And we're hearing about God's promises. And I'm so encouraged when I read through that first chapter of Joshua to see that God is so present in our lives. And he's so faithful to us. Uh, and when we're on the top of a mountain or in a dark valley, he's with us and faithful. So uh, sing with me um, together. And this is called Place of Rest. And there's a, 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 a little part in Joshua chapter 1 where it says God will give us a place of rest. I can't see the sun today Tears sting inside of my tired eyes The rain is so cold on my feet And my heart is heavy, so heavy But your promises are true And that is why I put my faith in you And upon my Father's chest I have found my place of you're with me you go with me you go with me and your promises are true and that is why I put my trust in you and upon And that is why I put my 
faith than you. And upon my father's chest, I have found my place of rest. 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 Isn't she so talented? Let's. Seriously, it's so beautiful. Thank you both of you. It's so great to have you kick us off again this year. So beautiful. We appreciate that. So let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, your good and gracious provision has brought us here again this year to Bible study for all. Thank you for the groups you've assembled here. And Lord, we ask you for wisdom as we move through four inspired books in your scriptures and seek to see our Redeemer Jesus at the center of it all. Open our hearts and minds to his truth and transform us by it. Amen. So, welcome friends. It's another year. I am so happy to be here, and I hope you all are as well. I'm Kristen Park. <laughs> I'm your teaching leader this year, and um, to those of you that are new, good to meet you. It's wonderful to have you join us, and we hope that you will let us know how we can make this a great year for you. And for those of you that are returning, and some of you I know for so many, many years, thank you for your loyalty to God's word and to one another, and for your willingness to share your perseverance in the race of faith with all of us here. Our theme this year, the undercurrent that I hope that all of you will keep in mind and recognize as we move through four different books of the Bible is believe God's promises. As you can see from the informational page we've provided, we're going to be studying Joshua, Judges, Galatians, and James. Of course, God's promises and his unwavering faithfulness to those promises are found all throughout the scriptures. But this year, we'll see specifically in these four books, those precious and very great promises God makes and never breaks, and therefore that we should believe and trust in. Joshua will show us the picture of the promise, a total victory, the Savior who delivers that victory, and his great salvation. Judges, in contrast, will show us our sinful rejection of the promises, the consequences of our disobedience and reluctance to fully surrender to the promises God has made in covenant with us. But we'll also find God's faithfulness to never break his promises despite our wretched faithlessness. Then Paul's letter to the Galatians will illustrate for us the realization of the promise. What do God's promises mean now that Christ Jesus has fulfilled and secured every promise in his life, death, and resurrection. And finally, the epistle of James will make clear the great power of God's promises in our lives, and it will show us how to truly embrace them. But believing God's promises and actually trusting in him to never break them, truly relying on them, is one of those things we think we understand until we are called upon to actually do it. And then we discover there is something very specific required 
to believe and take hold of those promises. It takes real and genuine faith. It might be through great pain, hardship, or trial that we must believe by faith that God's promises will be kept and they apply to us. Our longtime teacher, leader, and friend, Kathy, is a witness to this, as she is very recently enduring the sudden loss of her son, Toby. She and her family and their network of friends have had to believe God's promises in a way that is real, not theoretical or feel-good inspirational. Those of you who have had some time to spend with her or who have interacted with her since this tragedy can attest to this. What is it that is sustaining her and her family? <laughs> so they have had to trust in the promise that they are not alone in their grief. God is with them. Fear not, he says, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10. They have had to really believe the promise that God will heal them. It won't always hurt this bad, even though it doesn't feel like that could be possible. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's Psalm 147.3. They have had to believe that he will give them peace amidst their sorrow. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.7. They've had to believe that the one they have lost in Christ is alive, not sad, or missing them, or missing out. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 6. They've had to believe that one day their sadness will truly be no more. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, 4. And it makes all the difference. A life lived trusting in the promises of God is one of hope, joy, worship, gratitude, comfort, charity, peace, contentedness, and sacrificial love. And in contrast, a life without the promise of, promises of God is just the opposite. Uncertainty, anger, resentment, fear, grievance, depression, competition, conflict, complaining, self-centeredness, and true eternal loss. So God's promises are beautiful hopeful comforts to us, his people. But perhaps most importantly, they are a gift that he's given us to do the very thing for which we are created. When you trust in, believe in God's promises, you glorify, honor, worship, and enjoy him. Think about it. Trusting someone's promise is the most reverent honor that you can give that person. And the reverse is equally true. Imagine saying, I won't be needing a contract. I don't need the law to back this up. I just trust you. And conversely, the greatest contempt you bring upon a person is I wish I could, but I just can't trust you. That makes a person almost worthless. Martin Luther says this about trusting God's promises. Faith honors him whom it trusts with the most reverent and highest regard, since it considers him truthful and trustworthy. There is no other honor equal to the estimate of truthfulness and righteousness 
with which we honor him whom we trust. On the other hand, there is no way in which we can show greater contempt for a man than to regard him as false and wicked and to be suspicious of him, as we do when we do not trust him. So the thing he created us to do, glorify him. He's given us the means to do it by believing his promises and trusting him to keep them. What a gift. When you believe a promise of God, you honor and glorify him. So to begin this fall, we're going to be studying Joshua and Judges together in our first study booklet, which you received today. We'll start in Joshua, where I outlined that we see a picture of God's promise fulfilled. It's a book that solidifies future promise by fulfilling past promise. As the book opens, Joshua is commissioned by God to take up the leadership vacancy that is left by the death of Moses. God's people, the Israelites, are on the banks of the Jordan River, preparing to enter the Promised Land that they should have conquered 40 years earlier. But because of their mistrust in God's promise to give them this land, like he said, and drive out their enemies before them, the Lord punished that generation, and they wandered in the desert for 40 years instead. Those of you familiar with the book will recognize chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Claire included a little bit in her song, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law, excuse me, that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And what we'll find as we study Joshua is that although he obeys imperfectly, Joshua, by his obedience, and resulting conquest paints a picture for us, is a type of the one who will come and perfectly obey the law. The book of Joshua will continually point to another, better Joshua, who will do more than conquer our enemy, the devil, but also sin and death themselves. The book of Joshua will point us to a deliverer who promises to rescue sinners undeserving of mercy. We'll read in chapter 6 about Rahab, the prostitute, who is mercifully promised to be spared from the ensuing conquest and destruction of Jericho because of her faith. And in chapters 9 and 10, the Gibeonites will be spared Israel's wrath because Joshua insists God's people must be faithful to their word. We'll also see a conqueror who shares his inheritance with all the people. Chapters 13 through 22 recount the division of the land among the tribes of Israel. And here we see the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham back in Genesis, the beginning of the book, that his offspring would possess the land of Canaan. But this fulfillment foreshadows a better victory and a more rich inheritance. Our adoption as sons into the family of God and a place being prepared for us in heaven by the firstborn, Christ Jesus. And finally, as the book comes to a close, we'll see for the first time Joshua being called, like Moses before him, a servant of the Lord. In the book of Exodus, Joshua is referred to as an assistant of Moses. That's no doubt a high and prestigious position given Moses' standing before God and the people. But in prefiguring Christ, it will be Joshua's seeming demotion to servant that will be his most glorious title. Jesus said of himself that he came not to be served, but as a servant, to live his life as a ransom for many. That's Mark 10, 45. So the book of Joshua can be inspiring for its namesake's ability to be strong, courageous, faithful, and obedient, as we are often called to do. But Joshua didn't obey perfectly or completely. He is a type of Christ, yes, but
but he is also a flawed figure, showing us why we need the true Christ. Instead of a how-to, the book of Joshua should be more encouraging for it's about who. It's portrayal of God, who he is, and what he's telling us about himself and his relationship with his people as their ultimate conqueror, deliverer, servant, and savior, who suffered not just a, who offered not just a promised land, but a land in which he would fulfill all his promises. Believe those promises, friends. He has always kept them, and he will continue to do so. Next, we'll study the book of Judges, a disturbing picture of human sin where the scriptures hold up a mirror to our humanity, to our fallen human nature, and we see why we desperately need God's promises, and also what it looks like when we reject them, are afraid to believe them, live like they're not real. We'll also see God's faithfulness as a counterpoint, delivering his people time and again despite their distrust and idolatry. This book narrates the span of over 400 years of Israel's history spiraling downward into chaos and apostasy. And for us, it's been more than 3,000 years since the time of the judges. But much of what is recounted there doesn't lack parallels in our modern times. The particulars are ancient, but the general idea is still very familiar. Rebecca Pippert, in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker, writes, whatever controls us really is our God. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by he or she that this person wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the small L Lord of our life. There are still false religions and deities served by people around the world. But perhaps more perniciously, the idols that are vying for our worship today are the gods of wealth, achievement, pleasure, comfort, safety, security, longevity, conspicuous virtue, vague spirituality, radical tolerance, political ideology, and independence. The late Tim Keller wrote back in 2013, our era can be characterized by the phrase which sums up the whole book of Judges, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So how does the book of Judges help us to believe God's promises? Is it not just a book about horrible, sinful people forgetting God and doing horrible, sinful things? Even the judges, the supposed deliverers, the types of Christ, become more and more corrupt as their history unfolds. So where do we find the gospel? Well, the gospel in the Old Testament, what it's telling us about who Christ is and what he must do, is most often being defined by what he is not. For instance, we'll spend about a week looking at one of the most prominent judges, Samson. Samson is very strong and fairly clever. And the narrative tells us that when Samson had long hair, he was strong, but when it was short, he would be made weak. So what is that telling us? Chuck the scissors out, folks. It's time for long, luxurious locks. Of course not. It's saying in a roundabout, narrative way, no matter how strong you are or how clever you are, you are not God. So you cannot save yourself. You are not your own redeemer. You can't even control your own strength, which in Samson's case, God manifested in such a fragile, fleeting vessel as his hair. If you're going to depend on your own strength and wisdom, you're going to fail. This book and so much of the Old Testament portrays the gospel in contrast. Dr. Brian Chappell says it like this in the great film American Gospel. The people of God are given the law, but they break the law. So sacrifices and priests are provided, but the priests themselves become corrupt and unhelpful. Then the judges say, well, just do what's right in your own eyes. We'll figure out that that doesn't work. All right, pick a king, your tallest, strongest, handsomest guy. Well, the kings become selfish. 
So we'll give prophets to the kings, and the kings will learn what to do from the prophets. That sounds great, except the people kill the prophets. And you begin to understand that through the course of millennia, God is telling us we need a better law keeper. We need a better judge, a better sacrifice, a better priest, a better king. And as we move through judges with that in mind, here are some of the themes. We'll see God continually offering his grace to people who do not deserve it. We'll uncover a tension between God's law and God's grace that only the New Testament will resolve for us. We'll see the need for spiritual renewal in the lives of God's people then and now. We'll find the mysterious sovereignty of God working out its will in unexpected ways using weak and flawed people. We'll see our need for a true divine savior, Jesus. And you see, in its strange way, the book of Judges is the gospel. It shows us the Bible is not a rule book full of inspirational stories of people getting it right. Instead, it's God's story of keeping his promises to redeem his people despite their constant resistance to his love and purposes. So after Christmas and the new year, we'll spend two weeks wrapping up our study of Judges. Then we're going to jump forward into the New Testament to see the realization of the promise in Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Paul is worked up, and we should be too. The Lord, the God of Israel, has come to the earth in the person of Jesus and has answered all our claims on God's promises with a resounding yes. In Galatians 3, one of the most spectacular chapters in the Bible, Paul calls all Christians heirs according to promise. We can look back at Judges and we can breathe a sigh of relief because Paul says in chapter 1, this is not man's gospel. This comes from God. And Paul is going to help us resolve that tension we encountered between law and grace in the Old Testament, giving us a bigger answer than the question even asks. We're going to discover Paul asserting to the Galatian Christians that their primary spiritual problems don't stem from their failure of obedience, but instead from their reliance on it. And our theme will resound from this short letter saying salvation in Christ does not rest on a law that we inevitably break. It rests on a promise that God cannot break. God has promised forgiveness of sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. He has promised eternal life to everyone who comes to Christ in faith. God will not and cannot go back on his promise. His covenant is an irrevocable will and testament. It stands firm forever. Believe it. Finally, as we continue our mission to believe God's promises, we will finish in the epistle of James, written by its namesake, James, the brother of Jesus, to first century Jewish Christians. Here we are assured of the power of the promise, and we receive great wisdom for how to embrace it and live it. Has anyone ever been scared or intimidated by the book of James? Raise hands. <laughs> I have. You see, James is an imperative-laden book. Do this do that, you're not doing this, you're getting this wrong. Doesn't that fly in the face of the gospel of grace, of the whole message of Galatians? We're in the New Testament, but it's like we're back in Judges. Where's the gospel? Well, James teaches us that trusting God's promises is a consequence of saving faith, a sure benefit flowing out from it. In fact, he says, without trust or action, as he puts it, faith is shockingly indistinguishable from the faith of demons who believe and shudder before God, yet do not repent and surrender themselves to him. That's James 2.19. He will invoke Abraham and even Rahab, who we met back in Joshua, to illustrate his point that genuine faith brings forth action. Abraham had faith, he says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. James is pointing to the moment 
When God promised Abraham he would multiply his offspring like the stars in the sky, and then shortly thereafter commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac. In obedience, Abraham set out to do exactly that, right up until the moment God told him to stop. Abraham's actions weren't his righteousness. It was his faith. But he had the kind of faith that cannot help but act. James has been called a New Testament book of Proverbs. He quickly jumps from one idea to the next, quickly dispensing wisdom and precepts that follow on from a sure belief in the promises of God. Some of the highlights include that our genuine faith allows us to trust God's promises that he will watch over and provide for us, so we needn't be greedy and rely on riches. That we are perfectly esteemed as sons of God and needn't put on airs or favor the influential, rich, and powerful among us. We can believe his promises about the joys of heaven so we can bear up under our trials. We can believe a sure, divine reckoning is coming so we can leave judgment to God and go about loving our neighbors as ourselves. We can sacrificially pour ourselves out in faith here on earth, believing we will be rewarded in heaven for the very gifts God has given us by no merit or hard work of our own. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, will refer to probably each week during the study of James. Some commentaries refer to it as the gospel according to James. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. In other words, when you fail at obeying all the commands I'm giving you in this letter, which you will, God gives grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said. Well, James echoes that when he says, he gives grace to the humble, therefore humble yourself. I want you to imagine your best faith day, the day in your life, if you are a follower of Christ, where you've had the most faith, adhered to all of your spiritual disciplines, done the most good works, given the most sacrificially out of your material wealth. How do you stack up against the law and all the commands of God on just that day? And what's the standard? Well, the standard is the perfect holiness of God. So guess what? You will always be able to humble yourself. And he's not even asking us to do the thing that we'd find so impossible, to humble ourselves before our neighbors, or siblings, or spouses, or co-workers, or parents. Instead, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And there's the promise that we can believe. He will exalt you. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that he promotes us to the status of a servant. Remember who other servants were? Moses, Joshua, Jesus. Do you see what we've been offered? We've been promised the astonishing privilege to serve the Lord, the God of the universe, by his grace, with his gifts, for his glory. Believe that promise, friends. It is unlike any other. In Genesis chapter 3, we have an account of God's first explicit promise to his creation. In Latin, the historical church termed this the proto-evangelium, the first gospel, where God, speaking to Satan, says, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In the opening minutes, 
of The Passion of the Christ, the 2004 film portraying the final 12 hours of Jesus' life, there is a scene that, while unhistorical, does allegorically make reference to that first promise in the garden. Jesus is praying in the garden. Drops of bloody sweat are dripping off of him, and he's in agony as he contemplates the cross and the condemnation of the Father, and he prays, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And a snake begins to crawl toward him. <clears throat> a snake is that metaphor for disobedience and doubt, and it slithers over his hands that are in the dirt in prayer. And Jesus slowly stands up and then stomps. He crushes the snake's head with his heel. And this shows us that promise, the first gospel, would be costly for God to keep. Because at the moment on the cross that Christ is crushing the head of the serpent, defeating the corrupting power of sin and death, so at the same time, in one sense, Satan is striking out to kill the Christ, fulfilling a promise. And the whole Bible, from that point on, is unfolding that promise. Do you believe it? God promised to rescue his people from the curse of sin and death, but it wasn't possible by something or someone created. So he became a man, Jesus. Jesus lived the law perfectly, died himself as a sacrifice once for all, and by his power rose again, so that all the promises of God could find their yes in him. Let me say that again. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. It goes on. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen, our yes, to God for his glory. So when we experience the disbelief or doubt that God's promises aren't for us, or we struggle to believe he'll keep them and we can trust them. When we suffer through great loss, great persecution, or even our own great sin, we can in faith utter, yes, Lord, we believe your promises for your glory because of Jesus. Amen.